chapter 18. Knowing that the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Luke chapter 18. And I want to lift what should be a familiar passage of Scripture, beginning with verse 35. The NRSV translation reads this way. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he shouted even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately, let the church say immediately. Immediately, he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, praised God. Once again, for emphasis, verse 39, those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he shouted even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. As you claim your seats on the 138th church anniversary, I want to lift as a subject this thought. Excuse me while I shout. Look at somebody and tell them, excuse me while I shout. Tell somebody I got a reason to shout. 
If you knew what the Lord has brought me through, you wouldn't be looking at me crazy, but you'd be shouting, I got to excuse me. If I'm getting on your nerves, if I'm making too much noise for you, I'm sorry if you think this is undignified. You just going to have to excuse me. Tell somebody, just give me a little room. Excuse me while I let the floor have it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise your name. Praise your name. We got 138 reasons to give God glory today. We've got 138 reasons to tell God thank you today. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, we've already come. Excuse me. Excuse me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, you waited all week long. You might as well praise him. You went through the trouble of getting dressed and coming all the way to the son's house. You might as well give him a dance. You might as well give him a shout of victory. said amen. Be seated if you can. people said amen. 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 Just this week, just this week I was uh, sharing with a dear friend a video that I came across some time ago. 
I found a video on YouTube of, at the time, an 11-year-old boy who was both blind and autistic. He was led on stage at an event. He was brought center stage. And the story was shared by this relative that the mother of this boy had been a drug addict while pregnant with him. And as a result, he was born blind. Somehow, some way, he developed autism. And despite what others might perceive to be hindrances and handicaps, the boy stood center stage. And in perfect pitch, Derek, he offered this song to the Lord before this crowd. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. This was the request of a little boy who was both blind and autistic. What a lofty desire for someone so young and someone with perceived deficiencies not just to want to see, but to want to see him. For 138 years, Fairfield Baptist Church has been helping blind people see him. Today is a celebration not because of our own legacies, not because of ones from whom we have descended, not because of buildings we have erected, not because of land we have acquired, not because the budget has ballooned, not because membership has increased, but because for 138 years, The sight of the blind has been restored through this ministry. According to our text today, Jesus has already turned his face toward Jerusalem for what will be his ultimate destiny, dying on Calvary's cross. And as the writer of Luke Acts details Jesus' narrative from this lens, Jesus has fulfilled his mission as outlined in Luke chapter 4 as he quoted and read from the Isaiah scroll. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, to open the eyes of the blind, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he has done this, and, and Scripture lifts for us now that at this point in Jesus' journey, he has now made his way toward Jericho. There are significant things that will happen as Jesus comes to Jericho. For in Luke chapter 19, Jesus would encounter a thief and a robber employed by the Roman government as a chief tax collector named Zacchaeus. Somebody who has physical sight, 
but no real vision. And isn't that a sad state of affairs for people to have sight and still be unable to see? This was Zacchaeus' plight. He was short in stature. And in fact, the Bible tells us that he climbed in the sycamore tree because he wanted to get a good sight of Jesus. Jesus has been opening the eyes of the blind. And I want to submit to us, if you have not caught it already, that you can have physical sight and still be blind. Can I say it this way? You can still be in church and still be estranged from God. You can wear all of the designer clothes. You can dress your body really nice and still be far from the kingdom. You can have physical sight and still be unable to see. And before Jesus encounters Zacchaeus, he is making his way toward Jericho. And as he is traveling... There is a large crowd with him, and as he is moving, there are beggars along the roadside. Luke tells us in particular there was a blind beggar. If you were to read Mark's account, Mark would name him Bartimaeus. If you were to read Matthew's account, Matthew would say there were two blind beggars. But here in the Lucan narrative, in the third evangelist, we see that there is a singular blind man and he calls out from the roadside. When he realizes, the Bible says that he hears a crowd going by, he asks what is happening. And they told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then the Bible says he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And, and I, I, am, I am at a disadvantage today because I need more time than what I really have. But I do want to drop a couple of things on you as we begin this sermonic conversation. As Jesus approaches Jericho, this blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. He hears a crowd going by. He asks the crowd, what's happening? Who is it that's going by? And they declare Jesus of Nazareth. Can I say that again? This blind man is sitting by the roadside begging. He was a blind beggar. He hears something that's happening. He hears a commotion, and then he verbalizes what's going on internally. He asks, what is happening? What's all this noise about? And the crowd responds, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And then he shouts, Jesus Son of David, have mercy on me. I'm talking today to all of the folks who are upset with God about what you do not have. The brother who was a beggar on the side of the road was blind. He had no sight. He was at a societal disadvantage. He was at an economic disadvantage. He was, as some might even suggest, at a spiritual disadvantage. He had no sight, unable to provide for his family, totally dependent upon society to render alms so that he could make it Day by day, he had no sight. And although he had no sight, look at what he does have. He's still able to hear. He's not able to see, but he hears that there is a commotion. And when he hears a commotion, when he hears a crowd passing by, he then uses his voice and asks, what's all this noise about? And when he verbalizes his question, the crowd responds, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Can I give it to you again? He does not have sight. He cannot see, but he still has his hearing and he still has his 
his voice. And when he discovers that Jesus is passing by, he shouts out to Jesus to have mercy on him. I'm still talking to those who feel like they don't have everything they need to make it. I'm still talking to those who are comparing what you have with what somebody else has. But can I suggest to you this morning that whatever little you might have, if God has given it to you, it's enough to change your situation. It's enough to turn your life around. If you learn how to use what God has given you, then you will discover that you just might be on the edge of a breakthrough. Is there anybody here who can testify? I may not have what somebody else has, and we may not have what other churches might have, but if we learn how to use what we got, God is ready and willing to blow our minds. He does not have sight, but he can still hear. He does not have sight, but he can still speak. Go on and help me early in this message. Preach to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, learn how to use what you have. Learn how to use what you have. Learn how to use what you have. This message is not designed to be insensitive to the other able community. Even without sight, without physical sight, this brother still has intrinsic worth and value. I want to affirm all of those who feel every day marginalized because you have had to be creative and resourceful with how to navigate your life. You may not have physical sight. You may have trouble walking or the inability to walk under your own power. But I assure you that whatever you do have, God has given you something that makes you unique and valuable to the kingdom of God and profitable to the progress of this society and world. This brother who is unnamed in Luke's account does not have physical sight. But even still, all is not lost for him. Society has thrown him away. Society has relegated him not just to the physical roadsides of Jericho, but to the roadsides of life altogether. Isn't it amazing how people can push you to the side when they have determined that you are worthless? He is on the roadside begging and yet he hears a crowd going by he asks what is happening and they told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by then he shouted Jesus son of David have mercy on me now if you were listening with your preaching ear you would be shouting right now Because what the blind man said is not what the crowd told him. When the blind man asked what was happening, they told him Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He was identified by his place of origin. He was identified by his place of rearing. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. But when the blind man shouted out to Jesus, he did not call for Jesus of Nazareth. He called for Jesus, son of David. And I know some of y'all missed that, but there's a special nuance about what he professes, about what he calls out, because the crowd knows him.
him by where he's from but the blind man knows something about what he's able to do and all brothers and sisters when you know that God is able to make a difference in your life you talk to him differently you speak of him differently you call upon him differently the blind man said I don't need Jesus of Nazareth I need Jesus son of David to show up and show out and make a difference in my life and so excuse me while I shout blind man in so many words are saying I'm shouting because I know something you don't know I'm shouting because I know who I'm talking to and can I tell you that's why for 138 years Fairfield Baptist Church has been a special place. That's why this place has been a house of healing and a lighthouse for the lost. That's why for 138 years people have scratched their head when they've come in here because there's always a whole lot of noise. There's always a whole lot of shouting. Folk don't understand why we praise the way we do, why we sing the way we do why we shout the way we do it's because we know that there is something that has to happen when you call on the name of Jesus I may be going through hell but I know how to call on the name life may not be perfect but I've learned how to call on the name when I call on the name of Jesus Elbow somebody, tell them, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me while I sh excuse me. They told him, Deacon Dawson, that it was Jesus of Nazareth, but he shouts out, Jesus, son of David. Now, Reverend Walker, I got a problem with this. Because how would the blind man have known to call Jesus something different than what he was told? The text does not explicitly answer the question, but because of the way word traveled in the region of Judea, somehow, some way, the blind man would have had to hurt from somebody somewhere that there's a stranger in town he's giving sight there it is so, so, somehow some way he would have had to heard that that if you just call on him that that he'll hear your faintest cry and and he'll answer by and by so, somewhere along the way somebody would have had to tell this blind man about the saving power of Jesus Christ and oh brothers and sisters that's why you and I have a reason to shout today that's why you and I ought to be praising God on the 138th church anniversary today it is because somewhere along our life's journey somebody told us about Jesus some Sunday school teacher taught us about Jesus some revivalist preached about Jesus at some choir rehearsal we sung about Jesus somewhere along the line through the ministry of this branch of Zion we heard that there was power in the name of Jesus and so he 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 shouts he amplifies his voice. Jesus, son of David, son of David, have mercy on me. This is problematic and really could have gotten the blind man and Jesus in trouble because this was a political term. David, ancestor of Jesus, was king over all of Israel. It was the hope of Israel that God would send the Messiah to restore the fortunes of Israel and restore the throne of David. And what the blind man is acknowledging is this simple fact. I know who you are. I know who sent you. And I know what you've come to do. And I know that if you say so, that my life can turn around. I, I know who you are. Is there anybody here who can testify? That's the 
the reason why I've come today. I have not come just because it's the church's birthday. I have not come just to show off my new blue dress and my new green tie. But I've come because I know who he is. In fact, you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. What do you know? He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he shouted even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Understand, brothers and sisters, that this blind man would have been treated poorly. Blind beggars were an eyesore to the public. Understand that their total livelihood was dependent upon the public generosity. The region of Jericho was a city under Roman occupation. It had developed under Caesar and Rome. And Rome did not approve of the poor and the beggars. The truth is, the Jews really didn't either, but according to their faith, they would give alms to the poor, one, because it's what the law commanded them to do, but number two, they believed that if they gave to the poor, then they could use it as a bartering chip with God. In other words, the more I give to the poor, then the more God is inclined to answer my prayers the way that I want him to. So essentially, it really wasn't about taking care of the poor. It really wasn't about trying to be a blessing. It was really a focus upon how good I can make myself look to others and to God so that when I talk to God, I can get what I want. But all oh, brothers and sisters, God isn't working like that. God ain't set up like that you got to be real about what you do for him and you got to be real about what you do for God's people you better be very careful how you allow your mind to frame how you see view and treat others can anybody testify like the contemporary songwriter it could have been me outdoors no food no clothes or just alone without a friend can anybody testify that when you give to folks you better be real about it. How we treat other folk says everything about what we truly think about God. And so because they saw themselves as better than the beggar, they were rude to him. To all of my young people, 12 and under, cover your ears real quick. Please, thank you. Cover your ears. They said, shut up. Stop talking. You're embarrassing yourself. Just be quiet and sit there. And the people want to give you something, just be quiet and say thank you. Hmm. That's what they said to him. Y'all can uncover your ears. Thank you so much. They ordered him sternly to be quiet. That's what they said to him. But I like this brother. And I love what one translation says. Mother Davis, one translation says he became more indignant. He, he, he didn't have his sight, but there was nothing wrong with his hearing. In fact, medical experts say that, that when, when people are blind, that their other senses are heightened. So I am inclined to believe that he heard them very well. He didn't have a problem hearing. They told him to be quiet. 
But the more they told him to be quiet, the louder he got. Because when you know what you need from the Lord, does not matter who doesn't like it that's around you. Doesn't matter who has something to say about it. When you need something from God, I don't care what you think. You can turn your nose up at me all you want, but I got something that I need God to do. I got a way that I need. Is there anybody here who's made up in your mind? I don't care who doesn't like it. When I need something from God, I'm going to call on him. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry if you wanted us to be a little more quiet today. But, but I, I love this because the more they wanted him to shut up, the more he shouted. You missed it. The more they said, shh, the more he, the more they said, hey. The more he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What if the difference between you staying where you are and receiving your breakthrough is your willingness to open your mouth and shout about it? What if God was just waiting on you to stop worrying about your neighbor and just open your mouth? And is there anybody here who can help me? On the count of three, shout like you need God to make the one, two, three. Y'all be quiet. Be quiet. It don't take all that. He hadn't been that good. Be quiet. Sit down. Sit down. Be quiet. The more they told him to be quiet, the more he shouted, have mercy on me. But here's the, here's the thing, here's the thing. Now he has Jesus' attention. But nothing has changed yet. Because Jesus has not been told what the man wants. Notice that I did not say that Jesus doesn't know. I said Jesus has not been told what he wants. And so now that the blind man has an audience with Jesus, it is now up to him to tell Jesus what he wants. Can I tell you, Fairfield, now that you have the Lord's attention, you got to know what you want the Lord to do in your life. Now's not the time to be timid about what you need God to do. Now is the time to open your mouth and say, God, heal my body. Now that you got his attention, now is the time to say, Lord, restore my finances. Now is the time to say, Lord, bring my family back together. Lord, get my child off of drugs. Lord, touch me. Y'all be seated. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. So, so he, he has, he has Jesus' attention. But, but notice, <laughs> no, notice what the blind man 
asks for. Remember, he's not just blind, but according to the text, he's a blind beggar. Everything he gets in life, he receives from the hand of somebody else. Now, I know that when I read this text the first few times, that I would not have been mature enough to ask what this blind man asked for. Eric George Vicker Sr. would have said, I'm tired of begging every day. Lord, give me a job I can work from home at my laptop that would give me income every day. Or, Lord, send a millionaire giver that needs a tax write-off who can make a sizable tax-deductible contribution to my personal 4321 campaign. But that is not what he asked for. He says, Lord, I want to see again. Y'all missed it. The first thing he does when he responds is that he acknowledges once again who Jesus really is. He's not just Jesus of Nazareth. He's the son of David. And he's the Lord, which means he reserves the right to display his sovereign elasticity. That means he can do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it, to and with whomever he chooses to do it, because he's God all by himself. He says, Lord, I want to see again which signifies to us that at one point in his life he had the ability to see he lost it but he still wants it back he had joy he lost it but he wants it back he had peace he lost it but he wants it back I'm getting ready to come down your street in a minute. He had a smile. He lost it. And he wants it back. Can I suggest to you today on the 138th church anniversary, whatever it is that you lost, if you know who to ask and how to ask for it, I don't care what you lost, God can give it back to you. I don't care what you have that's missing right now. If you know who to ask and how to ask for it, he's able to give it back to you. He says, Lord, I want to see again. Understand, brothers and sisters, that what he asked Jesus to do is to give him something that will totally turn his life around. He does not ask for the easy thing. Y'all ain't getting this. He asks for the hard thing. You can tell when somebody really has radical faith by what they ask God to do. Asking for money would have been easy. But asking for his sight to be restored so that he could re-enter society, so that the world couldn't look at him the same, that's a different kind of prayer. Perhaps you are stuck in a faith-holding pattern because you have not yet reached the point of asking God for the hard thing. Perhaps you still feel distant from God 
because God is saying to you in your prayers, you can do better than that, and, and I can do more than that, and I'm bigger than that, and is that all that you want from me? What if God is waiting on you to ask him to eliminate $4 million in three years to his glory as one church? What if God is waiting on you to ask God, can I build the son's house? What if God is waiting on you to ask him, God, can we acquire 40 acres of land? What if God is waiting on you to ask him, can we build the senior citizens complex? Can we start an urban farm? Can we build a Whole Foods grocery store? What if God is waiting on you? I'm done. Jesus says to the blind man, receive your sight. Your faith. Your pistis. <laughs> your trust. Pisteo has made you whole. Your, your, your willingness to believe me for the unbelievable has made you whole. No, don't go there, Derek. Hold on. Your, your, because I'm ready. Your faith has made you whole. How, how did how did Jesus know that this blind brother's faith is what prompted him to have a conversation? It all started with a shout. That, that, that's all I'm trying to tell you. His, his breakthrough and his recovery started with a shout. He was still blind, but he kept shouting. He was still begging, but he kept shouting. Was still in pain, but he kept shouting. Still needed help, but he kept shouting. This text, brothers and sisters, I'm done is designed to trigger our memory about the last time we heard of some shouting in Jericho. I told you that Jesus was in Jericho when he met this blind beggar who was shouting. But this text is designed to remind us of the last time there was some shouting in Jericho. The last time there was some shouting in Jericho. God had sent some brothers to march around a wall. They marched around the wall. And folks thought they were crazy. But they kept on marching. They marched around the wall for six times. But on the seventh time, they started shouting. And the walls came tumbling down. And in this text... This brother's life changed. His blindness came tumbling down because he had the courage to shout. And I don't know who I'm talking to on the 138th church anniversary, but maybe nothing has changed because you haven't shouted yet. Maybe you're still blind because you haven't shouted. Maybe you're still suffering because you haven't shouted. Maybe God has not answered your prayer because you haven't shouted. But I dare you, if you know that God is able to turn your life around, to open your mouth and give God a shout of victory, it may not be well right now, but I dare you, to give God a shout. In fact, tell your neighbor, I 
know I've been quiet, but now it's time to make some noise. Excuse me while I shout. You may not be able to stay in your seat. Do whatever you got to do. You got pastor's permission to do what you need to do. If you got to get in the aisle, get in the aisle. If you got to jump, then start jumping. If you got to dance, start dancing. If you got to run, then take off. But I believe that if you open your mouth and give God a shout, that God is getting ready to hear your prayer. God is getting ready to open the door. Is there anybody here who can open your mouth and give God a shout? I believe you're the son of David. I believe you're the Lord of all creation. I believe you can speak and turn my life around. Is there anybody here ready to give God a shout? Is there anybody here ready to give God glory? One, two, one, two, three, shout! I'm not gonna wait till the battle is over. I'm not gonna wait till he works the miracle, but I'm gonna give him a shout right. Doors of the church are open. Tell your neighbor, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Hey! reason cry too many tears took too many medicine You may be here today. You may be here today. And you're saying within yourself, and I know that I need to make the next step in my relationship with God. Let me show you how much Jesus makes a difference in your life. The blind man went from sitting to following. He went from begging to giving. He, he went from sitting by the roadside to following Jesus on the way. And he went from begging 
for resources to giving God praise. When Jesus is close by, everything about your life can change if you're just willing to trust him. If you're just willing to shout and tell him what you need. If you're here today and you want Christ, you want a relationship with him, you can be saved today. Maybe you're saying, Pastor, I'm saved. I'm in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. But maybe you're looking for a church home. What better day than church anniversary to plug into a church home that will love you? If you're here, just come on. Main floor, balcony, worshiping online. If you're here, just come on. We're waiting on you. This is your day. This is your opportunity. Wherever you are, just come on. We're waiting on you. Ask somebody, excuse me, is pastor waiting on you?